security team. All right, lady in the third row has a question there. You. To what extent do you believe the agency is capable of controlling the development of nuclear weapons and thus safeguard the future of our world? Well, I think, I think we can do as much. The more we get authority, legal authority, to go places to get information, the more we get... Do you need more authority? I do, I do need more authority. Uh, in, in many countries, we still do not have this additional authority, the so-called additional protocol. Uh, we still have over 100 countries that have not given us that authority. Uh, the more authority I have to go places to get information, the more uh, financial resources I have. I, I run this whole verification, you know, w where we, we do an inspection on over 150 countries on a, on a budget of $120 million. That is less probably than one of the professional football clubs here in, 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 in Qatar. So we need resources, we need additional, you know, legal authority, and we need a, a full backing by the Security Council in case where a country is not in fulfilling its legal obligation. And ultimately, we need the nuclear weapon state, those who have nuclear weapons, to lead by example, to show the way. You cannot just tell everybody nuclear weapons are bad for you while we continue to refine our nuclear weapons. I use sometimes the, you know, the metaphor that I, you cannot you know, tell everybody not to smoke while you keep dangling a cigarette from your mouth. You, know, you, you don't have credibility if you do that. You know. Rana al Khalaf. Yeah, why did you choose such a profession, considering that um, there are many jobs which are less demanding and pay more? It's a good question, and my, my kids ask me that all, all the time, you know. I, well, I choose, I choose public service, you know. I, I choose public service because at the end of the day, I'd like to make a difference, you know, if I can. Uh, you can, uh, yes, I can make 10, 20 times more money if I want in the private sector, but uh, you reach a point if you have a decent standard of living, your, your sense of fulfillment does not really come from having additional money. Your sense of fulfillment for, comes from the non-monetary aspect of life, you know, having a good friend, taking a walk in the park, making a difference in the life of people. And I, I think that's, that's where I am. Tim is saying it's a lot of stress, yes. I don't sleep very well at night, yes. But, but sometimes when I see that I make a difference in resolving an issue or, and, and I should tell you that the agency is not just about non-proliferation. I mean, the agency is used nuclear energy for economic and social development. If I, recently I was in Ghana, for example, and I see that we were the one who provided a radiotherapy machine to, to help people, you know, who are diagnosed with cancer. You have no idea the sense of fulfillment you have of being able to help somebody who is in need. So it's, it's your future. It's your future. I'm saying, you know, people who are, who are in the private sector are doing a wonderful job, but people also, we need people to do the public service and public work. We need both, you know, we, and I have chosen that uh, voluntarily, and I'm very happy to be here. You're happy to hear that? Yes, I am very All happy. All right. Thanks. Ezra Al Mufta, you have a question. Can we go to that, please? A lot of personal questions. Yeah, that's nice. Do you feel it is difficult to draw lines between your job and your morals and loyalty to the Arabs? And do you feel pressurized by the fact that you are a Muslim Arab in the middle of a Western Eastern conflict? I don't feel any of that pressure at all. I think, uh, you know, I, I apply my full morals to my job. Uh, my morals is to be honest, is to be credible, is to have integrity. And I hope I haven't compromised any of that at any, at any time in my professional career. Uh, I think I, you know, I continue, you know, to be Arab, to continue to be Muslim, but also to continue to be a, a fellow global citizen. I don't think there's any difference between being an Arab and Muslim and being, and, and being a, a, a fellow global citizen of the world. I, as I told you, I believe deeply, spent more than half my life in the West, that we are all one human family. I, I feel as comfortable in the West as I feel I'm comfortable here in Qatar. I don't think th there's much difference. We, Yes, we are proud of our identity, we are proud of our background, we are pr proud of our religion, but, but we can also need to learn to be able to live with, with each other. I, I, I think I'm in, in where I am, I'm, I'm doing a service to my, my country, to my region, to my religion, to my you know, identity, by trying again to bring all these different factions together. Iran is a good example. Where I am, 
trying my very best to say, hold your horses, there is a better way to, to resolve this issue, and that is through respect and dialogue and, and transparency. Did you think it would be difficult to draw, for Dr. El Baradei to draw a line between yeah. his morals um, and his duties? I think that uh, you have been accused of uh, be working under pressure several times. For example, in the nuclear transaction between Niger and Iraq, when you clarified that there wasn't any transactions, but later many people accused you of, yeah, there were transactions, but you were covering them up for the sake of Iraq. I got, uh, if you mean it that, I mean, I got, I got you know, uh, pummeled by all, all different parts at different times. I mean, I've been criticized by the North Korean, by the Iraqis, by the Americans, by the Iranians, you name it, you know, uh, I think. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like Teflon. It doesn't stick because if... Doesn't it? Any of it? It doesn't. As long as you know that you are on the right track, as long as you, you, you go home at night, you look at the mirror, you have a clear conscience. And at the end of the day, you know, I have been vindicated. With, in the case of the Niger, for example, I've been uh, criticized that I've been soft in Iraq, I've been soft in Iran. Well, after, after the war in Iraq, we, 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 everybody have, have discovered that despite the fact I was told Mr. Baradei was wrong, Mr. Baradei was soft, that, that none of that did exist and it was absolute bogus. I, I, we act like a radar. We record what we see, but we do not hype, we do not read future intention. And that what we, that's why we have credibility. That's why we got not just me, but my organization, the, the Nobel Peace Prize. Gentlemen in the third row, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you think USA will in any way attack Iran uh, since it has occupied both Afghanistan and Iraq? Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't, as I said, I can't read the future. I can't judge the future plan of any country. All I'm saying, I'm hoping that, that all members of the international community act on the basis of facts. All members of the international community understand that the best way to resolve issues through peaceful means that only you know, when there is a clear and present danger which cannot be deterred through peaceful means that one can think of using a force and not only again through a, an authorization by the Security Council which has the centralized authority to use force in the world according to the system of legitimacy established by the United Nations Charter. Dr. Abarde, in the few moments we have left, we're sitting here in the Gulf it's one of the few forums where we can actually express opinions freely. What would you like to see the states in this region do to advance peace, to advance stability? How should they react to what is going on in Iran? There's a lot of nervousness in this region. What would you say to the states here? I'd like, I'd like obviously, all the states, I can't preach to them, but I'd like them to take charge. You know, I'd like to define their own security perception, their own security regime. They, I, I'd like them to, to think through how, what kind of future they would like to see. I'd like to, to, be, to, to see them to be an active player into the international community, an active positive player in adding to the human civilization. I think you, if, if, you, if you want that, you need two things. Tim. You need to, be, to have a scientific base of, the, of development and you have to have freedom and democracy. I think these are two, the two cornerstones of progress in this region. I've been saying that everywhere, that science is, is, is key to development. Uh, uh, democracy is a byproduct of modernity. Uh, you, sure, it will not come overnight. Sure, it cannot be imported, but there is no other way that, that at the end of the day, every Arab fee, should feel the right to, for, to, to, to speak freely, to worship freely, to be free from want, to be free from fear. I think if we do that, the Arab world will, every Arab citizen will do much better than what I have achieved myself. All right, Dr. Abarde. We've run out of time, unfortunately. Thank you very much for sparing the time to come to talk to us. Thank you to you, our audience as well. We'll be back with the Doha debate next month, but till then, from all of us on the team, thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.